Right, in our final session this afternoon then, we're going to do some horizon scanning and we're going to do it with the help of a, a fresh panel of experts who are going to uh, provide us with a range of perspectives. So what I'd like to do is uh, ask our four experts to come to, the, come to the stage just now. I'm going to say a few words of introduction. Please feel free to come up. You know who you are. If you don't know who you are, here we go. <laughs> First of all, and this may not be the order they're sitting in, but it's the order on my, on my list here, Dr. Nikos Pronios. Uh, Nick is lead technologist for ICT at Innovate UK, a diverse background in the ICT sector, the US and Europe. He's worked in, a, in various industry positions covering R&D, technical marketing, commercial activities. Um, currently using his diverse experience of more than 20 years to help UK organizations innovate and compete. So Nick. And Dr. Sabine Huert, you have to help me with the pronunciation. That's the way. Oh. That'll do. <laughs> Lecturer in robotics at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory where she designs swarms of nanobots for biomedical applications, sounds great. Passionate about science communication, very important. Uh, Sabine is the co-founder and president of RoboHub, which I hadn't realized, which is great. Uh, a non-profit dedicated to connecting the robotics community to the public and I use RoboHub a lot to find out what's going on, so <laughs> hurrah. Uh, Paul Clark, director of technology at Ocado, the world's largest online only grocery retailer. He co-wrote the first of Ocado's award-winning mobile apps which remain the only apps from a major retailer supporting full offline shopping. In his current role, Paul heads up Ocado Technology, whose 600 plus, so 600 plus software engineers and IT specialists are responsible for building all the software and IT infrastructure that powers Ocado's grocery and non-food businesses. And finally, uh, Dr. Chris Haley is head of new technology and startup research at Nesta. He leads Nesta's research on how that's his research on how startups and new technologies can drive economic growth and how to encourage innovative new firms. Now, you know, we've, we've not asked these, our, you know, august people to do much here. We're gonna, I'm going to invite each of them to do uh, a two-minute introduction to themselves and to answer the exam questions set by the, <laughs> set, set by the academy provide a brief overview of their perspective on how autonomy will change the UK in the next two years in two minutes. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and and I, do, I don't know which order we go in. Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, Sabine. Right. So I'm lecturer in robotics at the Bristol Robotics Lab and at the University of Bristol. My day job is to design robot swarms, so taking inspiration from birds and ants and their ability to do these beautiful, complex behaviors, I try to translate that to the real world. So I've designed swarms of flying robots that flock a little bit like the birds, and now I'm interested in making nanoparticles that swarm to be more efficient in the treatment and the imaging of cancer. So that's my day job. Uh, my night job is to run RoboHub, which is a nonprofit dedicated to connecting the robotics community to the public. I think empowering researchers to tell the story about their work is extremely important to inform the public, to help with, with, uh, with translation, uh, to help inspire the future generation of roboticists, and to balance the discussion. So I think that's something that's really needed. And we do that in a number of ways. We do that by helping them write blog posts, prepare videos, prepare podcasts, and then we make sure that that content reaches a very wide audience. Now, I'm convinced that robotics will change the way we work, the way we live, and the way we explore. And that's something that was recognized by the UK, one of the eight great technologies uh, in 2012, and something that has the potential uh, to impact the UK economy by creating growth and by creating jobs. And I think this goes beyond the basic manufacturing and towards manufacturing of new types of technologies, green tech, for example, the manufacturing of solar panels, and beyond manufacturing to things that we saw today, things like aerial robotics, things like service robots, robots for nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, sites, robots uh, to be able to help you with healthcare, and a number of other areas that we saw today. So there's really a large amount of potential. And I think with this potential comes questions from the public about jobs and societal challenges. And so I think it's quite interesting because if you look at the, inter the, the International Federation of Robotics in 2013, they put out a report that said that there would be about you know, more than two million jobs created by 2020. Uh, there's also been a lot in terms, you know, if you look at the robotics work that's done in Europe, 
a lot of it is based on co-robotics. So how can we make robots that work alongside humans? I think when Tony's developing that trade to go around and help elderly people, it's not to replace the care workers. It's really to provide something to help in their daily work so that they can go and do a meaningful job of actually interacting with the people that they care for. And so there's this positive vibe that we're hearing, at least from the robotics community, in terms of how robotics is going to impact jobs and how it's going to impact society. But if you look at what's portrayed in the media, it tends to be a little alarmist and it tends to be quite one-sided. And so I think we really need to think as a community, yes, it's great to look at what, you know, what industry is going to look like in the robotics world, but we should really, really be thinking about how we want to communicate uh, this, this change uh, in what's happening in society so that we are an integrative part of the discussion. And I think the way to do that is to empower roboticists to tell their story, make sure that the roboticists become the communicators of tomorrow and that we're really an embedded part of this. Because in the end, public perception drives policy and policy is what's going to impact all of us. Thank you. <coughs> Great. Um, so I'm Chris Haley. Uh, I work at Nesta, the Innovation Foundation. Um, in a former life, I was a historian of science, and um, it, it seems to me that many of the technologies we've spoken about today have the kinds of features that other historians have spoken about in terms of being general purpose technologies like steam power and like electrification. And what we saw with previous generations of general purpose technologies was that they were, in, they were um, accompanied by really quite profound social shifts. And many of those shifts, frankly, will be unpredictable, but I think we can foresee a few of those. So um, I think there will, there will probably be changes in ownership structure. So one thing, for instance, that um, autonomous vehicles allows is you know, cars to be shared between numbers of people and also additional value to be extracted. So you could see, for instance, um, uh, electricity generating companies getting on the act of leasing uh, autonomous vehicles, which can then generate uh, capacity in their spare time. One of my former colleagues, Greg Offer at Imperial, I think pointed out that um, when Fukushima went offline, there was uh, equivalent generating capacity in all the Toyota Priuses in, in Tokyo, but no way actually of um, harnessing that. So changes in ownership. Changes in risk. So we've heard a little bit of discussion about risk, but not, not enough, frankly. And particularly when we get into very complex systems, there are emergent properties and, and uh, concomitant risk, and we haven't really explored that. But as a society, we need to think about how to manage those risks and how they'll be spread out. Um, there will be changes to, for instance, structures of cities. So uh, I, I spoke about autonomous cars. Just think about how the structure of many American cities is physically, literally uh, determined by cars. You know, that's why American cities look so different to European cities, the, the grid layout. Um, and finally, one big area that we are exploring is, is jobs. So Sabina mentioned this a little bit. There's been a lot of discussion in um, the last few years about jobs. Uh, a paper by Fry and Osborne uh, suggesting that 47% or so of jobs may be uh, subject to automation. Um, that has significant consequences for uh, education, the skills that we teach our children. It has consequences for government, uh, how we look after the losers, because there will be losers from this. Uh, and it has consequences for society. How do we encourage people um, to realize that even though there may be individual losers, society as a whole should and must adopt greater automation. I'll stop there. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Paul. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, Paul Clark. I'm Director of Technology at Ocado. Um, if I was sat where you are this afternoon, I might be wondering what on earth the CTO of a grocery retailer is doing on a panel like this. <laughs> uh, but um, what many people don't understand or know is that underneath Ocado, there's a huge Aladdin's, Aladdin's cave of technology. In, in which ranges from robotics, automation, data science, machine learning, simulation, uh, you name it. And um, slightly unusually, we build almost all of that ourselves. We buy almost none of it to the constant annoyance of software companies who contact me. Um, and uh, that's what we can intend to continue doing. And across our business, there are uh, wide applications for autonomous systems. Um, I'll just name a few of them. So, for example, the obvious one is robotic picking of of our groceries, um, uh, which is surprisingly challenging because there's 14,500 items uh, already and that's growing uh, very fast. And groceries are, you know, um, irregularly shaped, short shelf life, very crushable. They don't uh, like necessarily, uh, you have, they have, there are segregation rules about what you can put with what. So for our, most of our research in that area is around vision systems. The robotic side is the relatively easy part. It's the vision systems, especially when you're picking into highly occluded area bags and things like that. Um, 
Another area that's very interesting to us is the whole kind of robotic maintenance and indeed hopefully construction of our highly automated facilities. And uh, that's one reason why we're part of two Horizon 2020 projects at the moment. One we're the, uh, the lead and one we're a member of to build uh, autonomous maintenance robots um, and uh, uh, end effectors for those. Um, as a delivery company, as you might expect, we're very interested in the whole area of uh, driverless vehicles, both within our facilities in form of sort of a AGVs and variants of that, our fleet operations, so uh, trunking uh, between uh, our depots, and then, of course, the last mile operation. And I think there we're very interested both in terms of what we will do in terms of push, but also what customers will do in terms of pull. So will customers have their own personal uh, collection vehicles, if you like, that they dispatch to, uh, to pull rather than uh, companies like us delivering to them. Uh, and then slightly further out, I, I'm particularly interested in this, this intersection which has been talked about already of the Internet of Things, smart machines and robotics because I think uh, in that cauldron there is the opportunity to produce you know, smart uh, uh, autonomous vehicles that are very plugged in as was said just now, to the outside world. And I think that's particularly interesting to us as a business in the areas of smart kitchens and smart homes. Um, but obviously there are many applications beyond that. And I think, um, going back to the area of you know, the winners and the losers, I think within our facilities, for us it's all about how we can use robotics to both improve the quality uh, and the value add of what human beings do um, either by augmenting them or by taking away some of the more uh, mundane jobs, but also how to keep them safe. So I think the whole area of health and safety, especially in, a, in an area like ours where there's a lot of machinery, is particularly interesting. I think I'll stop there. Okay. Nikos Pronius, sorry for passing the baton to the lady earlier. Uh, Nikos Pronius, I am lead technologist for ICT. So that means uh, since ICT is uh, infrastructure for a lot of those things that we discussed today, uh, I am one of the people that have uh, are been asked uh, what is the funding for RAS, which is one of the eight technologies, uh, and what does Innovate the UK uh, do about it. In any, anyway, uh, my focus uh, on today was for autonomous systems. Uh, con contrary to the majority, I think, for the people here, I believe that robotics is a subset of autonomous systems, and I have a particular view on what is an autonomous system. Uh, it seems to me that uh, I have a rather narrower view of what an autonomous system is, and I, I am in line with the people who believe that autonomous system is a system that, as the etymology says, can learn and create it its own rules. In most of the cases that we discussed today in robotics, the case is that we have um, a logic for the human in the loop, particularly in the training phase in the beginning, and we have automated very highly uh, agile and a lot of sensors and a lot of perception, but this is basically logic that we humans have embedded into the system. The type of things that I am looking mostly for right now are the things that are, the, you know, the machine learning things or the things that are, have self-adaptive uh, capabilities without necessarily these being pre-encoded into the system uh, on, uh, so b before its birth. In any way, uh, going, trying to predict on how UK would be in 10 years, I have to admit if I was better, I would have um, you know, invested some things in the stock market, so uh, <laughs> my crystal ball is not so good as uh, it might be to some, uh, some of you. But in any case, I think that the main challenges that we have right now are in four areas, are in uh, technical, because we do have some problems to solve, are societal, regulatory, and also uh, environmental to an extent. So uh, I believe that uh, there are things uh, in the autonomous systems that are not necessarily robotics, they're not cyber-physical systems. There are cases, for example, that uh, in, short, in, in a short span of year, I believe we will find that the so-called autonomous systems will find its way, th their way into the health and care domain, not, uh, uh, mainly as a decision support system. There are cases right now where machine learning can do much better prediction in, let's say, cancer uh, based on exams than the humans do. So these type of things, I think, will find their way easier into the 
everyday life, particularly because the fear of the uh, public for the so-called autonomy of the system will be mitigated by the decision that the, end do that the doctor will do at the end. So this is one way of, I think, that the public will be less fearful about uh, having an autonomous system of robots. And I think that, uh, I don't know if you have planned it also to have the iRobot yesterday on the TV to indicate this type <laughs> of problem, <laughs> but it was, it was a good indication about it. So uh, there are problems in technical part, but I think that the most important ones are regulatory and societal ones. So I'll stop here and I'm open to... Okay, thank you very much. That was a very brave attempt at a very tough uh, exam question set by the Royal Academy. You're all, you've all passed. Um, uh, right, so what I'd like to do now is throw the floor open. The, you, we have four eminent experts here. What is it you think we'd like to talk about and what perspectives would you like to illuminate or have illuminated about how autonomy will change the UK in the next, change the UK in the next 10 years? Who'd like to go first? Joe. <laughs> yeah. I was really fascinated by Paul Clark uh, and all the, the cases you came up with that, that you're working on um, and that you addressed the winners and losers thing. Um, my own experience in industry was as we automated, uh, the people that were employees were absolutely valued and uh, they all got to go home a couple hours earlier for a few months until people thought of more stuff for them to do. Uh, but I know that that is not happening across, uh, across all the different uh, 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 sectors, I guess is the right word. Um, are, what you said were really good uh, causes, but what, what can it be for a company like yours to make your workers valuable enough that you'll keep them around once you can, you can make each of them more efficient? I mean, what, what would that actually take? Well, I think the important thing to know is that uh, we, we are, um, well, if you like, the, 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 the hub of, what, of, a, of a much, much bigger business that we plan to become. So I think, you know, uh, uh, if, if you like, uh, whatever we do now in terms of what, what, how possibly um, uh, robots might replace individual jobs is really is of no real threat in terms of any of the people who work for us at the moment. So, you know, might there be a day in the future where there are, there are some things we do which, which no longer do? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, we're a long way off having uh, automated facilities with all the lights turned off uh, and just full of robots. I mean, you know, it's taken the car industry a long time to get anywhere close to that. And uh, in many ways, some of our challenges are actually quite a lot more challenging than building cars. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's a somewhat futuristic uh, concern. And I think most of the people who work for us now will probably be, uh, if not retired, um, certainly uh, do it, you know, will have moved on to other jobs. So it's, it's, I think it's somewhat academic. I think Chris was going to... I was yeah. just going to pick up a, yeah. what, one point there. I mean, I, I don't think this is particularly a futuristic concern. Um, I, it, it may be for your organization, but if you spoke about the example of the DLR, if you look at how trade unions have reacted to the potential suggestion that their jobs should be completely automated, you know, it, it's clear that many people right now are concerned that they will be replaced by automated systems. And, and we have to take these concerns seriously. You know, if, if I'm a train driver, that's a rational concern. But as a society, we need to think about how we overcome that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else like to respond to this mean? Yeah. I, I agree understanding what jobs will be needed in the future is very important and figuring out what training uh, people need for those future jobs is something we should be thinking about right now. I also think this is something that's not new. So I was just reading Alan Turing's biography and they were very worried, and you know, it was just the beginning of the computer, so they were already very worried about what the computer would do to their jobs. And so I think some, this is something that society as a whole is quite good at dealing with. Okay. Okay. Tony. <laughs> Yeah. And the issue is really wealth inequality, uh, and it's the, the one of the problems is that some of the new jobs are creating, and the report you mentioned are showing that uh, th 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 we're not creating uh, rewarding, well-paid jobs. We're, we're, we're creating some jobs which maybe aren't that great. Uh, we're, we know taxi drivers in London are threatened by Uber, uh, which is using technology to to undercut them. So, uh, and generally we're facing a situation where the rich get richer and, and there's fewer and fewer, more and more people who are uh, not doing well. So uh, it's about wealth distribution and I think we should probably as a community use our abilities to push for better wealth distribution. You know, it's not, 
maybe trickle-down economics won't work in the future and we need some more coherent plan to make sure that there are consumers out there that will be able to buy the groceries uh, because nobody benefits when the wealth, uh, the 1% own all the wealth and everyone else does nothing. Thank you for that, Tony. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Barbara Walker from Ioma. Uh, while we're on the subject of redundancy, I wonder what the panel thinks about the um, um, threat to jobs at the other end of the scale, not unskilled or skilled workers, but um, people perhaps at company board level, um, the prospect of intelligent systems being able to take over um, business planning, bit of the strategy and decision making from them. Um, people at the level of uh, civil servants creating public policy, uh, regulators creating regulation, the, the professions such as lawyers and accountants. Um, what uh, threats should they be aware of from intelligent systems? Okay. I can uh, start with it myself. Sure. Anyway, uh, I think that there, are, there is definitely uh, a space for significant improvement in simply using the data that are already available out there to be considered into decisions for the public. I don't foresee fast enough, you know, at least in my career or li even in lifetime, that we will have such an enhanced system that, you know, regardless of the policy, that they can substitute everybody but at, because at the end we do need at least at this level to have a person in uh, view of being in charge I do believe however as I mentioned earlier that there is significant space for improvement in making more quote-unquote intelligence decisions about things I was just gonna say I I see uh, very exciting opportunities in the whole area of, of both how robots and smart machines augment humans. I just think there are plenty of things that I spend my time doing uh, where I don't add value, and I would like to give that to something else to do, uh, whether that be answering emails or uh, some emails or <laughs> filing or uh, managing my calendar more smartly. And, uh, but, but, you know, and I, so I think there is an opportunity to, to help lift you know, humankind with these technologies you know, into more fulfilling roles. And I accept that you know, that won't be a completely even playing field. But at the same time, I agree with you. I think we're quite a way off, um, if you like, at the board from level, thinking that people are going to be, you know, robots are going to replace CEOs. Um, certainly my CEO, I think, probably <laughs> is not worrying about that. Uh, so we see, we see um, four categories of, of jobs that, that we think are relatively immune from, from automation. And these are the kind of what we call the, the kind of creative, the caring, the coding and the, and the contextual. And, and just to uh, expand on that, the, um, th there's actually a NIST report here which you can download, <laughs> um, which looks uh, explicitly at this question of creativity versus robots. And we actually have some data um, to, to back our, our theory that actually it's, the, it's these roles that require an element of imagination that are relatively safe for the, for the time being. Of course, what counts as creative um, probably will change a bit over time. Um, the second big category is, is the, the sort of the caring jobs. We've, we've heard a little bit about the need for empathetic interaction. And in our view, there will undoubtedly still remain a class of job which requires human interaction, um, which is not easily replaced. And then there are a couple of other categories. I mean, we, we're going to need people to kind of code and, and, and create these robots in the first place. Uh, and then there will undoubtedly still remain a need for a human to have kind of the overarching uh, view about which robots, which systems to use, and, and have that... Uh, sort of contextual oversight uh, to understand if the robot is doing the right job. Just a small word of context, I spent years making a computer program that could optimize a problem that I was trying to solve. Uh, and then I went on to crowd, crowdsourcing it, so basically putting it back on the cloud and having people uh, solve that problem, because people are very good problem solvers. And I think we're, we're still very far uh, from having a computer making the decisions that you would want to make at the levels that you're speaking about. Hi, uh, Vinayak from Cranfield University. Uh, my question is to Paul Clark, and input from other panel members uh, is welcome. The question is regarding coexistence of humans and autonomous systems, uh, given that we all agree that uh, totally lights out kind of system is, is not practical. Um, how do you plan to train people to work in an environment that is perceivably more superior 
to themselves, I mean, both physically, intellectually, and they work, they run itself, and are pretty much indifferent to human presence. Now, for example, in your robotic warehouse, now what do you think are the new age training methods uh, that could help people adapt and accept such environments? So, uh, certainly in terms of the um, Horizon 2020 project, the main one we're, we're, we're leading on, um, the whole goal there uh, is very much about uh, learning through observation, and that's certainly one of the challenges. These are, these are not, we're not going to be training these, these, these robots uh, from scratch. The whole idea is that they learn by actually watching you know, uh, existing engineers doing their tasks and anticipating uh, you know, what, if you like, their, their future needs are going to be. And you know, this is some of this work is obviously with our, our research partners. Uh, our main part is on the vision system side. Um, and that's, that's a very challenging part of that, how, how you get a, a robot to actually watch. I mean, it's, it's a bit like that famous case of the robot spotting somebody going to the fridge on a Friday afternoon and taking a beer out and then anticipating that when the football match is on, they're going to go to the fridge and take the beer out for them. You know, this is slightly kicking that up a few levels, actually watching a, a, a human engineer, you know, um, uh, and, and uh, working on a piece of conveyor or, or fixing a, a, another robot and actually... Uh, you know, seeing when it is that they're likely to need a second pair of hands or when they might be at risk of falling off a ladder or whatever it is and, and uh, providing support. So that's, that's the kinds of inference that we're interested in. We're not going to be training the, the robots to do a set of kind of learnt tasks on demand and um, uh, hence why it's quite a, it's quite a big five-year project. Did, the question was how do you train humans? Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, I, but I think actually something I wanted to say in that is another key important, a very important part of that is how you make the robots compliant so that they obviously don't harm the humans. So that's, a, that's another big part of this is in terms of the, 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 the soft kind of end effectors and the, and the kind of the, um, the control mechanisms to try and make sure that they can coexist in close proximity with, with human beings despite the fact that they're using tools and and, 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 and other things that could be potentially harmful. I don't know about, I don't think, in all honesty, I don't think, uh, certainly I've thought a lot about how we're going to have to train the, the, the humans, if you like, to work with the robots, but I mean, it's a very valid point. I'm sure we will have to do that, not least in terms of, um, there will be times when you will want the humans, obviously, to, to ask the robots rather than just have them anticipate. But I don't, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer to that, I'm afraid. It's not something I've certainly thought about a lot. Sabine, yeah, okay. <coughs> One of the goals in the field is to train um, the robots in a way you would train a coworker. So if you take the Baxter robot, you take its arm and then you show it the piece and then you lift the piece to the camera and it's able to scan the camera. So I think a lot of work is going really on the, on the robot side so that you don't have to go sit at a computer and program the lines of code uh, like you already have to do right now with industrial robots. Um, usually what I do, I try to research design interface for uh, remote uh, robot deliberation. And many times uh, autonomy, and many times we can see we can do great jobs without autonomy. So when I look at the autonomous system, sometimes I think also about semi-autonomy, semi-autonomous system. And uh, so uh, what I would like to say is a reflection about this. Sometimes it seems to me that the key of success is actually to address a semi-autonomy system. I don't know, if I drive a car, I can think about in the future. Uh, I don't know, answer to email while uh, the car is driving on its own. But I can also think about me sitting here actually just overlooking the car driving on itself, answering when the car, there are some problems so on. I'm sure, for example, when I think about autonomy and the OCAD, or to say I think you have a lot of problems problem with the robots, sometimes you have to address if you want to spend more money on the robot or just put somebody to monitoring or some job. The human in the loop will remain there for the near future, either in the, let's say, the design or the training phase, or even in the operation phase afterwards. Yeah, uh, well, because if you look at the cars, if you would look at what the, the ratings that the uh, transportation board in the U.S. Uh, have, uh, most of them are termed uh, automated, not autonomous. The last level has the autonomy as, a par as an item there. Uh, it is uh, the problem from the engineering viewpoint is uh, how will we accept a system in the verification and validation and then in the regulatory framework 
to be accepted as capable uh, to be on the road and in which uh, context or w based on which operation will, will we have it ready for. Right now, you know, we can have the park, we can, we, a car, we can go take it right next to the parking slot and maybe we'll do it. But then this is not how real life works in many cases. You're driving, the road is not there, there might be a, a, a brand new driver that cuts ac across you very quickly and anticipated, all of those things. We are not so good in dealing with uh, different uh, parameters than the ones that we have designed the system for. So in my view, there will be a smooth a human in the loop, either in the operation or in before, will be a way of uh, making the systems more and more acceptable by the public and reducing the fear and allowing us to um, adapt the regulatory and even uh, you know, uh, financial obligation that we might have. I'm quite interested by the fact that we're going to go through this tipping point where actually we're going to need much, much smarter systems to cope with the mixed uh, situation where we have robots and people than we are when we get to the point where all, driver, all cars are driverless. And I think um, uh, that, that's a, a bit of a shame. We can't kind of cut to the chase and get to the point where we just kind of one night turn them all on and, and, and then uh, uh, they'll probably be a lot safer than when we're in the middle ground. Um, and I think uh, talking to some of the people involved in this field, I think the whole area about how you, how you deal with the case that the human being has has in a sense switched off and is reading a book and whatever and then suddenly you need them to come back and be very present because you need to get to a point where actually the machine needs your help and how you'll do that quickly enough to avoid an accident and whether you have to have kind of call effectively the equivalent of call centers you know uh, who are who are handling the, that kind of sudden intervention you know via remotely you know with cameras rather than the driver who is now, um, you know, uh, immersed in some video or something. Uh, so I think there's, there's lots of interesting things to do with both having the human in the loop, but also whether the human is going, you know, going to be a help or a hindrance in some cases. I, I mean, I, th I think those are very sensible answers. One small uh, addition I would say is that sometimes the argument for having the human in the loop is, is an argument for vested interests, right? And I'd go back to the example of train drivers. I think, you know, I, fr frankly, I, I, I would... Um, if, if, if I were mayor of London, I would probably automate all of the tube tomorrow. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's an argument where actually the, uh, the, the, the unions are essentially saying that this is partly about giving people confidence in the system through our being there. I'm not convinced that there are very many things that they do that automated systems couldn't do. Yeah. It's, a legal, <coughs> it's a legal question as well, so it's much easier for the car makers to introduce this autonomy in a much more progressive way than it is for them to just bring in an autonomous car. So. Just a comment. Uh, if we look at the military side and the automation there, those of us who applied systems engineering principles to targeting and drones and things actually found you could find solutions to these problems, and it was incremental. And a very good thing I discovered about a year ago was it aligns exactly with what the international lawyers are saying are the solutions to these problems. And so I think there's a lot to learn. I won't go into any detail. The Royal Academy nod tells me to shut up as well as everybody else. <laughs> We've only just scr scratched the surface. You know, in two minutes, how can you each, you know, what, what more can you do? But I hope it's given you some food for thought. That's the, the important thing from this discussion and something that you can perhaps fuel a little bit of the discussion that we go into um, in the reception session afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to thank our four uh, panelists for their contribution. <laughs> Um, I hope you found today interesting and stimulating. I know several of you are here to sort of do a catch-up and find out what's, what's going on. I think some of the discussion points have been very interesting. The ones about wealth distribution and adoption, I think they're very important. Um, I, the first time somebody asked me about the, you know, robots taking away jobs, I went to look at some graphs of things like GDP and productivity and, and so on. And if you go all the way back to the Luddites and the, you know, smash their machines and so on, um, you know, what you see over time is that as new generations of technology, waves of technology have been introduced, what you see basically is the line which shows productivity going up you know, pretty much in a straight line. You see the line that is unemployment pretty much being flat as a percentage. 
Um, and the things that really affect unemployment are financial, not technological. Yeah, it's the Wall Street crash, that kind of thing, that actually has the biggest effect on, the, on people's employment. And so in the short term, absolutely, you know, train drivers lose their jobs, taxi drivers lose their jobs, and there's some retraining thing that has to go on. And, you know, it's quite difficult to see what some of those other opportunities will be for, for those people. You know, we've been, been there before with the coal miners, right? I know people who were retraining coal miners who, who had to find new jobs, and that was tough. But, you know, the reality is Tony and I and several others were, had the privilege of going to Japan for a week earlier in the year, and we, we got to look at what's happening in the Japanese um, ecosystem there. And certainly... You know, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, is chairing the Robot Revolution Realization Council over there. So they have a very strong government drive to bring robotics into play. Um, and what that means is that the, not just Japan, but elsewhere, Korea, you know, uh, the US and so on, yeah, Europe even, with the Horizon 2020 program, the rest of the world is moving quickly in this direction, and we have to do the same. So... The, the exam question for us isn't, you know, do we do it, do we not do it? The question is, how do we keep up? But at the same time, you know, maintain some, some social conscience about how we do it um, and think about how the wealth can be spread. I, I'm not sure I know the answer. It's perhaps to some extent uh, uh, political as well as, uh, uh, as, well as, uh, as economic. Um, as I said earlier, I think um, who will be the risk taker that enable some of this technology to be taken up? Who will be, who will be the customers for the startups? And it's, it's businesses like Ocado, for example, who are, you know, um, in the UK, who are, who are taking a lead in using this technology, developing technology, um, uh, and others that we've heard today, um, which, are, which are going to be important. I think government as risk taker. Though some of you may have come across Mariana Mazzucato. She's a an economist from Sussex, I think, and she, I think she was quite influential with, with the last administration in particular, influencing people like David Willis, um, who recognized that government should be one of the important sponsors to enable some of this technology to be de-risked. And she's did a great um, TED talk, if you haven't seen it, go and look at it, um, where basically she, she points out that all the technology in your smartphone, from the screen to the wireless to the GPS, you know, started with government sponsorship. Yeah? It was all DARPA and DOD um, and some NSF in, in the U.S. And without that, you wouldn't have had the technology that Apple and all the rest could then take up and, to, and take to market. So government has a very important role to play. Um, as I've said, you know, our government, um, I believe, is on side um, in helping the U.K. Despite straightened times and austerity and so on, um, I believe they understand the importance of this and we, we wait with interest to see how the new administration will um, respond to our pleas <laughs> for, for support, support in different ways. Um, I think the emphasis is on productivity they, well, and we've seen this in the press recently and so productivity gain is an important thing for, uh, for, our, for the current administration and that's something this technology can deliver so therefore there is the, the opportunity I think for UK to be a player. We certainly have the talent um, you know, the, where the new developments are coming is largely in software. It's algorithms. It's the thing that makes the dumb iron smart. Right? And although we missed the first wave of, of manufacturing robotic systems in particular, the manipulators and the arms and stuff, you know, um, we have a fantastic research base in this area that can be part of making the dumb iron smart, making the, um, the, the intelligent tools that we need to move forward. And so there's everything to play for for us. And so I look forward to um, seeing how that evolves, and indeed with all of you being part of that big adventure to capture some of the wealth for the, for the UK. So I'd like to thank all of today's speakers for the most interesting presentations and for answering questions on the panels. I think that was very well done. Um, there will be a short report from today's discussions. Philippa tells me it will be within a couple of months, <laughs> uh, and it will be published uh, on the Academy website. There's a place to go to hear the, hear the results of that. As I mentioned in my comments at the beginning, this is part of a series, the first of which was held in January 2012 on innovation in construction, followed by events on technology-based companies, automotive, medical technologies, materials, energy, and aerospace. And the next event, innovation in agri-tech, will take place on the 12th of October 2015 here in the Academy. So um, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the, the afternoon. 
Um, and I'd like to ask the audience to give a round of applause to the speakers and the panel members.